The name China traveled down the Silk Road in antiquity and eventually came to be used as the name for the large nation that covered most of the eastern coastline of Asia. The name China was probably derived from the name of a single ancient Chinese dynasty, that of the Qin, whose brief rule over a unified China marked the beginning of the age of imperial China. The Qin dominance over other Chinese states, though years in the making, was accomplished in just nine years under a single king known today as Qin Shi Huang and the rise to power of the first emperor of China deserves to be remembered. The Zhou dynasty gained power around 1046 BC after overthrowing the previous Shang dynasty. Though the Zhou became the longest lasting dynasty in Chinese history, after about 300 years their actual power began to decline. Local warlords took power over tiny fiefdoms and the Zhou were helpless to stop it. The kingdom eventually coalesced into seven major Chinese states by the 5th century BC. Known as the Warring States period, the Zhou held little power and could do nothing to stop their subjects from fighting amongst themselves. Many famous Chinese lived during this tumultuous time, such as Lao Tzu, Confucius, and Sun Tzu. The future Qin Shi Huang was born around 259 BC to Prince Yi Yin of the Kingdom of Qin. At the time, the prince was being held by the Zhou state as a political prisoner meant to ensure peace between the two states. Yi Yan was only a minor prince and son of the heir apparent Lord Angu and a concubine, but Angu had no legitimate sons through his wife. In fact, Angu was only the heir apparent because his long-lived father, the Bright King, still ruled and had outlived Angu's older brother. Yi Yan stood little chance of becoming king. Enter the merchant Lu Bu Wei. According to the records of the Grand Historian, Bu Wei saw in Yi Yen an opportunity for advancement in power. He convinced Yi Yen to begin a campaign of flattery meant to endear him to Anju's wife, the Lady of the Glorious Sun. Eventually, the two convinced her to ask her husband to recognize Yi Yen as her adopted son and his heir. Angu agreed. The birth of the first emperor has been marred throughout history by an accusation that he was not the legitimate heir. According to the records of the Grand Historian, Yi Yen's wife was a courtesan named Zhao Zhi. Zhao Zhi had been a concubine of Lu Bu Wei. Bu Wei gave up Zhao Zhi, who took up with Yi Yen, but not before, according to the historian, becoming pregnant with Bu Wei's child. That accusation has been repeated uncritically by later writers, but it actually wasn't written until more than a hundred years after the emperor's death, written by a dynasty that was actively hostile towards the memory of the first emperor. So it might be nothing more than political slander. The prince was given the name Yin Zhang. When Zhang was two, his great-grandfather, the Bright King, attacked Zhou, where Yi Yan and his family were still prisoners. Yi Yen was sentenced to death, but escaped when a servant disguised himself as the prince, while Bu Wei and Yi Yen slipped out the city. The Bright King was also responsible for the end of the Zhou. The Zhou made a preemptive attack to stave off an impending invasion, but the Qin pushed it back and defeated the Zhou King, who died in their custody shortly thereafter. They seized eight of the nine tripod cauldrons, seen as symbols of the Mandate of Heaven. The last flew away before they could capture it. Qin scholars wrote that, Nowadays, the house of Zhou has been destroyed. The line of the sons of heaven has been severed. There is no greater turmoil than the absence of the son of heaven. The bright king died in 251 BC after ruling for 57 years. Lord Angu was crowned, but died just three days later. He is generally thought to have died of old age or illness, but conspiracy can't be ruled out. Lu Bu Wei became grand counselor on the elevation of his protege, Yi Yan. But Yi Yen too died quickly after ruling for only three years. No explanation is given for his sudden death, but Bu Wei and his former lover Zhao Zhi became the regents of the 13-year-old Zhang. Bu Wei hired a scholar from the state of Shu called Li Si to teach Zhang, which he would later come to regret. Si was ambitious and like Bu Wei saw opportunity for advancement in Qin. Competition for power in the state was very real. Bu Wei deliberately delayed Zhang's manhood ceremony and distracted Zhao Zhi by introducing her to Lao Ai, who pretended to be a eunuch and had two secret sons with the Queen Dowager. Zhang was prevented from taking the throne when he turned 20, first by the sight of a tailed comet, considered the first certain record of Halley's Comet, and then by the death of his grandmother. When he was 22, Zhang visited the grave of his ancestor, the Warring Duke, who was famous for throwing out scheming ministers. Bu Wei could not have missed the symbolism and allowed Zhang 
to be crowned. Qin, though, was at a crossroads. One source said that in Qin, the question is always the same. Are you the Empress in Lao Ai's man or Lu Bu-wei's? Lao Ai made his move after Zhang's coronation, using the Queen Dowager's signet ring to convince royal guards to follow his orders in an attempted coup. Zhang put the coup down, captured Lao Ai, and had him pulled apart by chariots. Ai's family was killed as well, including the secret sons. Zhou Ji was put under house arrest. Bu Wei was replaced by Li Si, and shortly after, killed himself. Starting in 230 BC, Qin attacked and captured the weak state of Han. They then turned on to the state of Zhou, which they defeated by spreading rumors that the Zhou general was disloyal. The competent general was killed, and Zhou's lesser generals were defeated by the Qin. The kingdom of Yin was next on Qin's list. The heir apparent was Yin Din, also known as the Red Prince. The Red Prince feared for his kingdom and hired a man named Jing He to assassinate Zhang. He convinced a Qin general who had fled to Yin to commit suicide, so He could take his head to Zhang as a means of getting close. The Red Prince also gave He a map of Yin's defenses with a thin knife rolled inside. The dagger was coated with a dangerous poison. He would only have to nick the king to kill him. Jing He succeeded in getting an audience with Zhang and brought a young boy to carry the map while He carried the box that contained the general's head. In the throne room, no one except the king was allowed to be armed, and no one was allowed on the king's dais without his express permission. As they approached him, the youth became so nervous that he froze. Jing He laughed it off, saying that the boy had never seen such splendor. He set aside the head and took the map himself. As Zhang unrolled the map, the knife was revealed. He grabbed the king's sleeve, but it tore, and the king jumped backwards. Zhang struggled with his huge ceremonial sword while his paralyzed nobles looked on. They yelled for the guards who were outside the room. The king hid behind a pillar and finally yanked the sword free. He stabbed He in the thigh. He threw the dagger, but missed, hitting the pillar instead. Both Jing He and his accomplice were killed. Zhang was furious, and he ordered his armies to attack Yin. Desperate for peace, the king of Yin had the Red Prince killed as an apology, which brought the kingdom a short reprieve before the Qin armies attacked again. Qin conquered the state of Wei next by destroying the dams that protected Wei's capital from flooding by the Yellow River. Only five years in, Qin's enemies had gone from six states to just two. Qin's next target was Shu, the largest of their foes. Shu surprised the first army that invaded, forcing Zhang to pull his best general out of retirement. After a series of battles, Shu fell in 222 BC, and only the state of Qi remained. Qin had already bribed the counselor of Qi to stay out of the earlier wars. Qi's armies were ill-prepared, but the Qin army bypassed them completely, arriving by surprise on the young king's doorstep. He surrendered without a fight. All six kings have been chastised as they deserved, Zhang said. All under heaven is brought to heel. In only nine years, Qin had become the sole power in China. To recognize his accomplishment, Zhang and his ministers came up with an entirely new title. They dug into Chinese myth and combined the term Huang, which referred to the mythical three sovereigns, and Di, which referred to the ancient five emperors, because now he had outshone even those legendary rulers. Huang Di came to being emperor, and Zhang changed his name to Qin Shi Huang Di, or first emperor of the Qin. He declared that his dynasty would last for 10,000 generations. Qin Shi Huang oversaw massive government reforms, aimed at keeping his disparate empire united. Li Si was the driving force behind his change. He thought that the tradition of empowering incompetent children and family was a mistake, and instead created 36 provinces run by government appointees who earned their jobs by merit. Defensive walls that had stood between the states were torn down, and the many northern fortifications were extended and reinforced into a single fortification, the first Great Wall of China. The Wien Wall was mostly made of rammed earth and used natural obstacles as often as possible. Coinage was standardized across the kingdom, as was a unit of gold. Hundreds of miles of road was built to support movement, trade, and tax collection. Perhaps most importantly, the Qin standardized and simplified Chinese writing across the empire, primarily so Qin's laws could be understood everywhere. They even standardized the length of axles, so all wagons would fit into the road's ruts. That wasn't to say that all was peaceful. Purges against those who had fought or disagreed with the Qin persisted. One man, Zhao Jian Li, had played a very minor role in Jing He's assassination attempt, and would have been killed except that he was a talented musician. He was blinded instead, but allowed to play before the emperor. Jian Li kept playing for the king until for one performance he was within arm's length. 
taking his chance, he swung his instrument, which had been filled with lead. He was easily disarmed and killed. The Qin Empire was highly legalistic, with a complex system of laws that offered the wealthy many opportunities to pay in place of punishment in order to fill the kingdom's coffers. It was accepted policy to torture witnesses to uh, clarify their testimony. Neighbors were encouraged to implicate neighbors to reduce their own punishments or get paid. Mutilation was common, from cutting off noses and toes to punitive tattoos. Another punishment was hard labor to build the roads and the Great Wall. One writer called the Qin government the first police state in history. Like all rulers, Qin Shi Huang found that he was not immune to mortality. Already construction had begun on his enormous mausoleum, and the thought of his death troubled him greatly. A scholar claimed that beyond the eastern seas lay islands where the gods lived, and the emperor gave him a lavish budget to build a fleet and go find the secret to immortality. On one of his tours, the emperor faced his third assassination attempt. A disgruntled nobleman from a conquered state hired a strongman to throw a huge rock down a hill and smash the emperor's wagon. But they smashed the wrong wagon. Zhang retreated to his palace for safety. Later in his rule, Li Si convinced the emperor to destroy books that could lead his subjects to believe in a false golden age of the past and thus find discontent in their own lives. The emperor ultimately ordered many works destroyed, though copies of them were kept for the imperial. The most dangerous books were considered poetry, philosophy, and history books written in other states. Modern scholars think that the tale in the records might be exaggerated, but that some books were burned and that many more of them may have been destroyed after the fall of the dynasty. The emperor was still obsessed with finding immortality. He had a garden built where he tried to lose himself in nature, and he built a huge network of tunnels that were meant to keep his whereabouts secret so he could attain enlightenment by divesting himself of earthly concerns. He had an army of alchemists and scholars researching immortality, but grew frustrated when he found that several of them were lying to him. He had hundreds interrogated, and he sought leads, and ultimately had 460 of them killed. Though this accusation, too, has faced modern scrutiny, as it isn't mentioned in any source but the hostile records. Frightened by what he felt were ominous omens, the emperor decided to take another tour of his empire. He brought Li Si, as well as his young 18th son, Hu Hai. He died on September 10th, 210 BC, of an unknown illness, possibly caused by a concoction meant to be an elixir of immortality that contained mercury. The emperor wrote to his eldest son, Prince Fusu, who had been exiled to the border, forgiving him and asking the boy to bury his father. Hu Hai's tutor, Zhao Gao, received the note and instead convinced Hu Hai to take the throne. Li Si was brought into the conspiracy and the three of them drafted a new letter for the eldest son. The letter reprimanded Fu Su for his failures and ordered him to commit suicide. Fu Su obeyed. The conspirators chose to hide the emperor's death until they could reach the safety of the capital. They allowed no one to see him and had a fish cart stationed nearby the wagon to mask the smell of the emperor's body. When they reached the capital, they announced the emperor's death and crowned Hu Hai, claiming the emperor had chosen him as successor. Zhao Gao led purges that targeted Hu Hai's siblings and anyone else loyal to the first emperor. Rebellions broke out all over China. Hu Hai had little control over armies and so ordered the thousands of laborers at his father's tomb to take up weapons and fight back an invading force. Li Si tried to direct the king but only found himself arrested and killed by Zhao Gao. Qin's armies fell apart without leadership, some even defecting. When Hu Hai finally tra tried to take control of the kingdom, Zhao Gao ordered royal guards to attack the emperor's estate, and Hu Hai was forced to kill himself. Zhao Gao made a new plant princeling king and publicly gave up any claim to control the other states, hoping that would be enough to save the kingdom. It seems that Gao had underestimated his princeling, however, and the young king took his first chance to stab and kill the minister. Only 46 days after he was crowned, the prince surrendered to the army of Lu Ben, who had once worked on the first emperor's tomb. Ben burned the Qin capital, including the imperial libraries, and left it to rot. Ben would soon become the first emperor of a new dynasty, the Han. Ben's dynasty was aggressively anti-Qin, but actually maintained many of the changes that the Qin instituted, and built a scholarly class to run the imperial government. It did loosen many of the strict legalistic practices of the Qin and focused heavily on the demonization of the former dynasty, which seems to have given Qin Shi Huang his poor historical reputation, although in the 20th century scholars have begun to rehabilitate the ancient emperor. For centuries it was believed that the emperor's tomb was lost or destroyed over the millennia, although artifacts of terracotta were common. It wasn't until 1974 that locals digging for a well found most of a terracotta figure, and that caught the attention of the ailing Chairman Mao, Today, the Terracotta Army, some 7,000 realistic soldiers, are ranged around the Emperor's tomb, 
or one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in China. The emperor's tomb itself seems to have been found, but not yet opened. Qin Shi Huang's 10,000 year empire in the end only lasted a couple of decades and other emperors would rise and take China in different directions. But in many ways the first emperor unified China in ways that it had never done before. And his reforms and changes not only solidified the empire but set the groundwork for the modern nation state of China today by emphasizing bonds of culture. Qin's rule was certainly not without controversy, and towards the end of his rule became so personally obsessed with finding immortality that he neglected all the things that he had built. But the, the empire that had so deftly used things like conspiracy and subterfuge and spying to rise to power was in the end brought down by those same activities, brought low by the competing ambitions of its ministers. But though its rule was only brief, the Qin dynasty had significant impacts on history and culture. World history would simply not be the same were it not for the emperor of the Terracotta Army. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>